The leader of this church, who's glazed in the window behind me, would ask of you to be for now in regard to restorative justice and prisons and the moral rule that Sheila spoke about, to be a leader different than you have been. And so I'm honored to come and talk to you about that opportunity. And I'm gonna trick Frank because only a small part of what I'm gonna talk about is really public defense. What I think is at the core of what was spoken about so far is this. And you're in part responsible for it. I'm in part responsible for it. Everybody is responsible from elementary school through middle school, through high school and college and the Marines and on sports teams and wherever you have been in your life, you have been taught certain rules which are part and parcel of your mind. Those rules are if you break a rule, there will be consequences. If you break the law, you'll go to jail. If you do something wrong, you have to pay for it. That's the way we have been taught. And it therefore is absolutely no accident that our system is based on a presumption of incarceration. We presume that what we have to do to keep the moral order is to punish people, to deliberately inflict pain on people. And we've been trained to think that way. And in fact, every, if, you, if you apply this lens to how you look at these issues as a church, You'll see yourself falling into this trap. You'll see politicians falling into this trap. Come down to Albany on any day of the week that the Codes Committee in either house is meeting. And you will watch what is actually an orgy of hatred pouring forth, pouring forth in the nature of legislative suggestions as to how to make the penalties for criminal activity harsher, more onerous, more extensive, more deadly than they already are. That is something that the church must be about. Now ask me why. I was trying to, I didn't know who was gonna be here, and I still don't know who's here. So I'm gonna pretend you're all from Bethesda, but whether you're Jewish or Christian or Muslim, there is something I wanna start by sharing. In Isaiah, there is a statement, and it's repeated again in the Gospel of Matthew. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. And that teaching is accepted in Islam as well. And it's what this church and this idea needs to be about. We have a system that breaks people. I actually was given the opportunity to come up with a title for this speech. This one was given to me and I didn't get around to it, How to Repair a Broken Criminal Justice System. And I want to share with you my thinking, I don't really want you to repair a broken criminal justice system. I want us to be about repairing broken people. And that's what the church needs to be about. And the criminal justice system is a complete and utter misnomer. We shouldn't even have it pass over our lips. We live in a criminal control system. Justice is not part of it. I know this will come as a broad shock to the bureaucrats who run our system. And I mean by that cops, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, Parole, corrections. This is an industry, my friends. It's an industry. It's not an accident that every time an initiative that comes forward to do the kind of instinctively thing, what it, I was taking notes on everybody. It was marvelous, both of you. The restorative impulse. David talked about the restorative impulse. Do you know that every one of you comes to the morning with a restorative impulse? That's what comes from your faith tradition. It's a normal, natural, human reaction. And it is squelched by our criminal control system. And it's squelched because we presume a particular kind of outcome. And that outcome is punishment 
for the commission of crime. This is a deadly cycle, and it's what creates the problem that Sheila was talking about. It's what gives hope to what David was talking about, and it's really what I was asked to come here to talk about. But I wanted to share this first, because it seems to me I'm going to ask you to challenge the church as, it, as I understand it. You're launching at this moment something very, very new, although Gordon makes clear it's very, very old. So does your window make somewhat clear that it's very, very old. Um, but you're at a moment where you can do whatever you want. So I, I have to tell you about a trip I took two months from now. I came right up this street, and what I saw was a white banner hanging off the front of this church. And what it said was, they sentenced a brother of ours today. I said, wow, that's a church like that one in Brooklyn where every time an injustice takes place, they make a point for the neighborhood that they're not going to stand for that injustice because they know that what prisons do to people is to actually destroy them. Right? What does this system do? And this is the exact opposite of what David and restorative justice were talking about. It shames people. It brings people into a courtroom for a public shaming process. It isolates them from the rest of the community. It punishes them for the behavior they engaged in, and it takes away the one thing that would make them whole, which is to be accountable for the behavior that they engaged in. I was thinking earlier when Sheila spoke, I once gave a speech in Napanak Prison, and I described I, I used to work as a legal aid lawyer in the South Bronx, and I was describing to the inmates to give them the kind of personal hope that Sheila was talking about, what does it mean to be a kind of person who spring traps a cellar door so that a person walking over it falls in and can become an easy prey for robbery? What does it mean to have that be the thing that binds you for the rest of your life, the description of yourself as that moment in time? Um, we are, as defense lawyers, I can tell you that the first thing that I would tell to the client who did that if they were picked up is don't talk to anybody. Don't talk to law enforcement. Don't speak. Don't admit guilt. Don't be accountable for that behavior. We have to face the system. We'll face it together. We have confidentiality when we speak, but make sure you don't talk to anybody. Certainly don't apologize for that. Certainly don't be accountable for that. Certainly don't go down to the emergency room for that. Certainly don't see that old woman at the instant that she is bleeding from her nostril. Certainly don't feel what happened because our system isn't designed to have that happen. Our system is designed to take people for the behavior and do process them through the system and make sure that at the end of it, they are punished. We believe in three things. Trail them, nail them, jail them. That's what we do. We don't ask any questions about what happened before you did that awful event. We don't ask any questions about what will happen in the future to prevent it. We talk about, let's get them for what they did. Now, I will indicate, as, as Frank wants me to, I want to talk about each of the pieces of the system regarding that model. And I want you to think about yourself as church people breaking free of it. I want you to keep this glazed image in your mind and recognize that what Christianity and Judaism and Islam are about doing is speaking truth to power and changing the relationship between humans and their governments and their world. And God knows that we need to do this, particularly in our criminal control system. I want to talk about one other thing first, because I don't want you to think I'm talking about you creating alternatives to incarceration. I'm not. In fact, our folks are all responsible for that phrase. We thought that phrase up, because having any alternative to prison is better than not having prison. But think about the language for a second. 
The reason why we use the language alternatives to incarceration is because through elementary school and middle school and high school, we've been trained to believe that the only thing we do for crime is incarcerate. So it's natural if you don't like that, what do you want to do? You want to have an alternative to incarceration. But we need a system and a world that actually makes the alternative prison. That our first instinct, our first instinct, is what can we do to bring someone back into the community? The reason why restorative justice began in third world nations, um, in native communities, among aboriginal people, the Native Americans, is because they don't function in a system creating stigma for a defendant, isolation, shame, and punishment. Their view is everybody's supposed to come back into the circle. We're building community here. A person who commits a crime is eventually supposed to come back into our circle. So we can't shame them, stigmatize them, punish them, abandon them, and isolate them. We need to embrace them. And how is that done? That's done by having a different worldview of what we're talking about. But what is our worldview? Our worldview is, well, I got a hammer. Every problem must be a nail. Let's hit it. And that's what we do. We take the hammer, we hit the nail, we presume incarceration, and we go forward with a criminal justice system that is inordinately, inordinately, a, an orgy of expenditure. Just think about prisons for a second. I always think about this, it always, I think about a white castle. But I don't mean that in the racial terms. I think about, those of you, how many of you are from New York City originally? Okay, so you know White Castle, right? It used to be 10 cents for those hamburgers, and now a little more expensive. They're like $3.50 in a prison vending machine. Now think about that, a White Castle hamburger, $3.50, I think maybe two of them for $3.50. The vending machines gorge people. The prison industrial complex, right, is, is a real phenomenon. It has to do with security and batons and concertina wire. And now there's people, if you go to an ACA convention, the American Correctional Association, there'll be like 900 exhibitors at that convention. All of them have a bright idea, a, a plug-in cell, that if you're building prisons quickly, you can just dump them in and you can have that cell right away. And, and sally ports and all kinds of doors. That's an industry. And so dislodging that industry is very, very hard work. And it starts with you inside your head, remembering that elementary school taught you wrong, and that the presumption of incarceration is wrong, that sending people to prison in the main is wrong. And I say this, I said, Sheila, a thing I gave a talk a while back, and you know, I'm often asked the question, well, well, do you really believe there should be no prisons? And my answer is yes, certainly not the prisons that we have. Our prisons are institutions which harm people, and by people, I mean the guards who work in the prisons and the prisoners who work there. What kind of an, what kind of an industry is that, right? I mean, the NYSCOBA union, God bless you, NYSCOBA, um, who represents the guards in this state, will fight every year to either build more prisons or not close them, despite the fact that guards have some of the highest blood pressure of any law enforcement entity. They have feet problems because they spend their time on concrete. They have alcoholism problems, they have domestic violence problems, and they have an inordinate rate of suicide. And their union, can you imagine this at UAW? If every fifth car, the United Auto Workers, somebody lost a hand on the machinery, they said, oh, let's get two more factories in Detroit, that's really good. But NYSCOBA, the union for guards, not taking into account the life of their workers, wants more prisons, because there's a disconnect. And at some point, we will have to liberate the prisoners and the guards together if we're going to be successful. Now, that's going to be very, very hard work. But churches need to do that work. Okay, so let's go on. We got trail and we got nail and Let's talk about victims for a second. I will get to public defense, I promise. But the path to victims is through, the path to public defense is through victims because we purport to say, 
And I mean by we, our law enforcement officials, our public officials, our presidents, our leaders, they all say that this psychotic system is devoted to the victim. They say that. In fact, I'm going to read you something I was moved by. I was moved by the kind of thing that Sheila said. Let me read you this fear language. Tell me if you've ever heard this. Because I can tell you, you can hear it in any court, in any community, anywhere in the country, every single day. The only way we can restore the victim's peace of mind is to lock up the offender. The victim needs to know that he won't be heard ever again by this man. For the sake of the victim, we need to know he'll never get out. We may not be able to bring back the victim in this case, but we can rest assured that the criminal will never be set free. For the safety of the community, this defendant deserves the maximum punishment that can be imposed. Sound familiar? You could hear that on TV. You could also hear it in the county court in Saratoga. And the public defender is here and he's shaking his head, yes, so I know I'm right. Now what does that mean? What does that mean if we are talking about victims as if they're pawns, but doing virtually nothing for them? So expand your vision as well to speak and work on behalf of victims, but to do so in real ways, because victims are at the core of restorative justice. It's actually a victim-oriented process. It's to give the opportunity for the victim and the defendant in the community to be made whole, as if they might be viewed as bruised reeds from your perspective. Um, let me talk about cops. First of all, I'd like to say as a disclaimer that Right now, my office <clears throat> that has a restorative justice practitioner is in negotiations with the New York City Police Department to train them in restorative justice techniques, to be part of the process that has flown from, uh, flowed from, I guess, the Floyd settlement and the stop and frisk case, and to try and have relationships built between communities, particularly communities of color, and the police department, because that's one of the legal obligations under the Floyd settlement. It's taking time to do, but it's really important. I think it's important for us as church people to recognize that there are mothers in East New York who send their child off to school, and they have reason to be afraid that their child may not make it home. That their child may, because of the color of their child's skin, confront a police officer, and die. You've seen it all across the country. It's been happening. I've been in this business for 47 years. This is nothing new. What's new is the cell phone. But there is also a wife in Rockland County who watches her husband get into some damn SUV to drive to work to the precinct where he will do his job and she's scared to death that she won't see him at night. And until the church and the world starts to talk about those things as the same issue, we're not going to get very far, but that's what empowers you. Because nobody else is talking about it. You can be the voice for that. And that's what it will mean to really take this on and to look at the world in a new way. That said, I want to tell you what's wrong with cops, or a part of what's wrong with cops. This business, the reason we're talking about working, the reason why there were 4.4 million illegal stop and frisks in the city of New York who were the subject of that settlement is because they're out of control. They're out of control in the same way that our soldiers, who we love and we send and we support, who we represent when they come home, but you go to war, you get out of control. That's what happens. We train people to kill. We train them to kill well. We train them to kill well and to, and, to, and to follow orders in doing it. And a lot of the bad things we're hearing about, it's the same with police. Kids come in and they say, you know, I really don't want a desk job. I, can't, I couldn't sit behind a desk. It drive me crazy. I want to help people. I love the idea of being out, you know, making calls, radio runs, and doing things. That's, that's how cops start. They really do, many of them. And after a while, they see so many things. And nobody cares about their trauma at all. It's beginning to happen, but nobody, for a long time, they were viewed just as centurions. They wouldn't be traumatized, but they are. They begin to change, and that's why we have that phrase in our culture, the thin blue line. So whenever a cop does something wrong, 
is encircled by other people who cover for him. I tell you, I've been in this business long enough to recall an event in the United States Supreme Court. It was a case called Mapp versus Ohio. <clears throat> Before Mapp versus Ohio, <clears throat> police officers would testify in the city of New York, and I suspect elsewhere, but I was in the city of New York. They would testify and they'd say, I came up to the client, I turned him around, I searched him, I found these drugs, and that's that. And you'd be convicted of drug possession. Mapp versus Ohio came along and held that it was illegal and that those drugs could be suppressed because the Fourth Amendment prevents that search. So then cops started testifying this way after they figured it out. I did, in fact, uh, I, I approached the car. I did, in fact, apprehend the perpetrator. And as he exited the vehicle, I saw him drop the drugs to the ground. This testimony was so pervasive that it, it came to be named dropsy testimony. And you could go from courtroom to courtroom to courtroom and hear dropsy testimony. Then it was condemned by a judge. and things changed, and what you've just seen in New York is now we have marijuana offenses, right? Marijuana in plain view is an, is a, an actual crime. Marijuana not in plain view on your person for a small amount is not. So guess what? Why did we have those like thousands of marijuana in plain view cases? Do you think it is because we only represent the stupid class? No. It's because cops would go up and shake down kids, take marijuana out of their pocket, now it's in plain view and they would arrest them. So, in, in Mappers, Ohio, I think it was 1966, and it goes on. And it will continue to go on because the model is the model of the hammer and the nail. So we gotta get rid of the hammer and the nail and the presumption of incarceration and everything we learned in elementary school and try to give a way of thinking that we can do other things. What who in God's name would pick up hundreds of thousands of young black children for possession of a small amount of marijuana that you search them illegally to get? Why does that happen? Why do we let that happen? We shouldn't let that happen. Now the question has come up recently because of the cell phones. Can we trust prosecutors to prosecute police for these illegal activities and these beatings and these killings. What is the answer? The answer is something like this. The police and prosecutors are like conjoint twins. Sometimes they share a small amount of organs together. Sometimes, you know, they have two heads coming out of the same shoulder. But it's, it's really silly to think that a person who relies on the police every day to arrest people and bring them evidence and to make their cases and to be their witness. People that they rely on because the system, remember, is a hammer and nail system. It's illogical to believe that, that DAs are going to prosecute, prosecutors are going to prosecute the cops they work with. You can create the mythology. If you listen to the prosecutors, they'll say they can. And indeed, there are some but they're few and far between. They're sort of like conjoint twins. Um, I think there's another thing you ought to think about as church people. Every prosecution in this state is a prosecution that says the people of the state of New York versus so-and-so. How do you feel about that? You're the people. How do you feel about that? Are they really doing on your behalf what it is you want to have done. And I, I don't mean by this to belittle uh, cops and prosecutors. I do think they're both very traumatized. Oscar may feel differently given that he's been recently traumatized by them, but the reality is when you work in a sick system, you become ill. To miss that point is to miss what's wrong with criminal justice. It's kind of like, you know, if you're asked, and I do refer here to prisons, if you're asked to run a concentration camp, you come out like a Nazi. It's not escapable. The, the problem with prisons is that people are taken from their homes, and they may, as Sheila said, have done very, very bad things. A moment in time, a moment in time. But sometimes a sentence is 25 to life, 22 to life. 
I mean, can you think quickly where you were 25 years ago? Is your life the same? I don't think so. Mine wasn't, and I know where I was. I was doing the same thing 25 years ago, and my life was not the same. Um, <clears throat> the thought of all these years growing without your children, that's pretty painful. The thought of not, even though you have a right to it, to going to the funeral for your grandmother. The thought of the fact that during <clears throat> this critical period in your life, the last thing you're allowed to be in prison is vulnerable. You can't really show your vulnerability. If you want to weep, you gotta weep in your cell at night. There are people who do better with this than others, but it's not easy to be a whole human being in prison. So what happens to a person who's served a long period of time, forcing themselves not to be a whole human being when they come out? I was saying on the way over here, well, one of the things is, you know, you serve a long time, it's hard to remember to look both ways when you cross the street. I've had stories from a number of men over the years who couldn't wait to get home to take their wife out to dinner. And when they did it, after the meal, they would take their silverware up to the front tray because that was a pattern and practice of their life. I have a couple of members on my client advisory board who together have served about uh, 180 years or something like that in prison. A couple of them have described how for a year or so after they got out of prison, they stayed in their bedroom in their apartment. Even though they were free, they were used to retreating to the only place that was safe for them, which was their cell. And another member of my client advisory board, when we discussed this, said she used to hoard like potato chips and stuff for if she ever got keep locked. And now she finds her whole desk drawer is like full of potato chips and stuff. Because we make, with these institutions, what people become. And we need to strike at that root and branch. I started to say, I often get asked the question, um, well, how many people do you think should be in prison? I probably, I'm willing to give anybody the percentage. Okay, say 10%, right? You wanna say that? We have 52,000 people in prison right now, about that number. So. All right, 5,200 of them, you want to keep them, keep them. Let's talk about what we're going to do with the other 45,000. And then you'd have the opportunity to make the remaining kind of institution something like Halden Prison, right, in Norway. I think it's Norway, right? The, the most humane prison on Earth. It's got 20-foot walls, but they're like dormitory walls. I mean, they're like dormitory rooms. There's no locks. They teach people culinary arts. They train their guards to do the same thing that I was talking about earlier. They train them that their, their goal, their success, comes from rehabilitation. We could do that. But we'd have to liberate the guards and the prisoners at the same time. So that leads me with some fun to trial judges. Many of the trial judges that we know in this state in criminal cases are former DAs. It's like a little pattern. You, <clears throat> you get pumped up in some plant in Chicago and then you're sent out to all the counties as a district attorney and you stay in the vineyards and of course you're young when you get there. So your life experience is really virtually nothing. You move from, from law school, you move from college to law school to practice, but you have an inordinate amount of power over the lives of people. Now sometimes you have no power because your, your boss is somewhat crazy doesn't want to treat you as a professional, so you can't make any kind of negotiation with anybody. And sometimes you just feel the influence of that power in your inability to see through circumstances. And so it's often very tough because you have people without life experience taking the life experience of other people and misinterpreting it daily, hourly, weekly. What happens to those DAs? They become trial judges. Most of them, a lot of them. I mean, not most of them, but if you take a look at the OCA website and you look at county court judges and you look at the bios, and someday I'd like some bright, eager student to actually do this, you find they serve time as DAs. So they have a pattern of becoming first prosecutors, then trial judges. Well, that's not really helpful, right? Here's another thing that people ask about. Well, can't juries protect us against that? So the answer to that is, well, yes and no. The yes side of that is the real great hope for the American common law jury 
I can't read that, but you're probably telling me I'm out of time, five minutes. Um, that's really hard. Um, the, the inability to, to uh, voir dire a jury, right, which are also made by trial judges and appellate courts, it's limited to 15 minutes in New York State. And some judges will allow you to do more. Some will hire, stay at that rule. So there's no way to pick an impartial jury in 15 minutes. I don't care what anyone tells you. Um, that's a problem, and it skews things. I guess I better quickly go to public defense. We have a broken public defense system. I've been in it for um, my professional life, as Frank said. I've been the director of the New York State Defenders Association since 1978. <clears throat> when I took the job, the state's public defense system was viewed by the state legislature as defective. It's defective because when Gideon versus Wainwright was decided by the Supreme Court, saying there was a right to counsel, uh, New York delegated the responsibility for that to counties. And counties themselves have never really been up to the task of providing adequate resources to the defense. So if you were to, for example, and some of you uh, said you had been in New York, if you got on the New York State Thruway in the Bronx and you drove all the way to Buffalo, you would pass through county after county, and each one would be radically different from the county before, and sometimes you'd hit a good spot, and there would be not only a, a funded and able public defender uh, who has investigative support and some resources, who could be there at your arraignment and represent you, and you might drive to the next county, I mean, God forbid you should be arrested in all of them, but if you were arrested in the next one, you would end up with an assigned counsel plan that takes three or four weeks to get a lawyer to represent you, and sometimes calls to our backup center to find a lawyer to represent you. And sometimes you'll draw on a defender who will represent you but will have no investigative capacity. It's a patchwork quilt. We're trying to fix it. But think about it in the context of these other things. Think about it in the context of the hammer and the nail. Think about it when you look at the prosecutors who take as their charge prosecution, conviction, and sentence. By the way, often you'll be asked, if you get into this, how many people are exonerated in New York State for crimes for which they were charged, prosecuted, found guilty, often by a jury, sentenced, and sentenced to prison? Since 1989, we have now documented through the University of Michigan 208 of those cases. That's a lot of people wrongfully convicted for crimes. And when you look at the amount of time that they've spent, it's really pretty scary. 34 years, 28 years, 27 years, 26 years, 26, 26, 26, 25. It's a, <clears throat> the, the maximum is 34 years. The average is 11.3. <clears throat> you know, the people from New York criticize upstate defenders often. And they say, you know, we got it really good down here. The vast majority of those exonerations, 70%, come from the city of New York. 146 of them. What were the contributing factors? Perjury or false accusations, 137. Official misconduct, 113. Mistaken witness identification, 74. So think about not having an investigator. Think about not having adequate staff. Think about having a caseload of a thousand cases. Think about the idea of coming up against a well-funded prosecutor. Think about the idea of coming before a judge who was a prosecutor. Think about a law created in a legislature where people are really more interested in the two rules of legislation, which are one, get elected, and two, get reelected. Who pass these bills for the purpose of electoral politics, making things crueler and more extensive. Think about that as you think about what you might do here. Now, I got a minute more, or two. I just want to say one thing, because if I were you, and I were new to this, I'd say, holy crap, I just came here for a speech. I don't really want to do this. I want you to think about that banner. I can tell you the one thing that I have learned in my entire career. It is so simple, and it is so real, and it is this. And it used to be, there used to be probation officers did this. What most 
of my clients and Oscar's clients and people need who are in the system is one person who cares about it. That makes the absolute critical difference in the lives of people. One person who cares about them. You can be those people. Secondly, <clears throat> you don't have to have that, have that banner right away, but you first have to reject the idea that you need to be an expert to transform this system. And please don't think about reforming it, think about transforming it. And you don't have to be that expert because the instinct that you have for what's right and what's wrong is already well formed. You may have crust around the edges from that stuff you learned in elementary school, but if you leave this to the bureaucrats who are making a fortune on this system, and I include in that, you know, all of us. It's, it's a prison industrial complex. You know, this prison industrial complex started with a quote from Eisenhower. We formally called it the military industrial complex, and he said, Every gun that's made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. Well, it's true here too. This idea, if you go down to the legislature next week, they'll be dealing with the budget. Every single criminal justice official on the face of the earth, including myself, will be seeking more money to make things right. But we always come up with the solutions and we embed them in criminal justice. I'd like to embed them in Bethesda. For 10 years, I ran a furniture program for my church. You have no idea how many people in this community have furniture they don't need. You have no idea how much that is needed by people coming out of drug court, by people coming out of prison, by people <clears throat> all over the place. You could marry those two things in an afternoon and you would be a hero. You can make jobs and employment available if you have them to give, and you will be a hero. Um, there's another thing going on in the state that I think would be marvelous, and my managing attorney, Charlie O'Brien, keeps wanting me to do this and figure out a way, so here I'm gonna figure out a way. It's now legal in the state of New York to have not-for-profit bail funds. There are a lot of fees associated with it, so some of the poorer groups that would love to run one are having a hard time setting them up. <coughs> But you could set them up. You could set them up in the whole capital district. You could create not-for-profits. You've got lawyers here who can do it. You could create bail funds and it would make a difference. While we dither in debate, are we ever gonna end money bail? Which we ought to, but you know, this is not the moment. I mean, when you look at this campaign that we're in the middle of, I'm not sure we're gonna have the revolution at the level of government. But I am sure that we could have the revolution in the hearts and minds of people in these pews. So, I'm getting the hook. I can stay here. I won't, I'll leave it up to the discussion. I thank you uh, for your time.